Hi, CTN. How are you? Uh, Chris Perrin here, writer, director of the Willoughby's. And today I'm going to talk about our process of adapting a uh, work of short fiction into a feature film for Netflix. So I'm going to share my screen and walk you through just our process and how uh, the art and design and the, the world around us influenced the choices we made as we were taking the, the book and turning it into a film. So let me share my keynote here. So the film, as you all know, is called The Willoughby's. And uh, when I was working in L.A. in 2016, I met a producer by the name of Lou Carroll, and he had optioned this book uh, by the Newbery Award winning author Lois Lowry. Um, I read the book and what immediately attracted me to the story was the subversive kind of dark, twisted sense of humor in Lois Lowry's writing. And if you're not familiar with her work, she's written some fantastic books from Gossamer, The, the, the Giver. And like, they're, they're, she's got this ability to kind of find heart and quirkiness in her characters. And in the Willoughby's, like there was this really great observation of children's literature. And she was really riffing on the tropes around that world. The story is essentially about four kids that want to be orphans. The only problem is they have parents. Uh, kind of terrible rotten parents in that kind of rolled doll way, but parents nonetheless. So when it came to the idea of doing a pitch back, I got really attracted to the notion that in this book was a tremendously interesting, unusual, quirky story about family. Not normal family. I mean, a funny tale of, of, of neglect and dysfunction. It was sort of my Hollywood pitch back was basically it was Grey Gardens meets Arrested Development for kids. So I pitched it back to the studio in Vancouver, Braun Animation. They got really excited about this notion of, of, of a dark, subversive family comedy. So in terms of like taking the words in Lois Lowry's book and transforming them to the screen, there was a notion of this old fashioned family that felt really sticky. And we started to design around that. So I cast a net to different production designers. I was working with a guy named Pete Oswald, this idea of like this old fashioned family. And you can see Heidi Smith riffing on this and uh, Walter Tulip and uh, a fellow named Robin Joseph, who I'd worked with out of Toronto. He came up with this idea of four feral kids raised by books. Now, all of these notions, design is sort of coming along at the same time as I'm working on script. And one of the things that felt really sticky as we were building out of the book was this notion of an old fashioned family colliding with a contemporary modern world, hence the Grey Gardens idea. So we wanted to kind of give this story a point of view. We wanted to let the audience know that that was the bit, that this was the comedy entrance into the film, and that none of this was a documentary because we were dealing with some pretty sketchy subject matter here. So we needed a vehicle by which to deliver that information. Now in the book, there was a cat named uh, Cat, which ironically, if you look at Mary Poppins, the cat in that story was named Willoughby. So the fact that this cat didn't have a name in this story and that he was sort of present, but there was a reference to a children's piece of literature, that sort of felt like an interesting entry point. The other thing that we had attached to the film already was Ricky Gervais. So these are some early cat designs that Robin did. So as we started thinking of the cat as being our voice, as our narrator, as our entrance, we started imagining that what if we cast Ricky into that role? The reason would be that Ricky as a performer as a comedian is very good at doing that observational humor where he's like poking fun at the stupidity of humans. And he, as an animal lover, there was a lot of things that sort of felt cat-like. So as Craig Kelman, our designer, started to kind of build out this sort of shape language around this idea of, of, of this, you know, kind of bard, this, this, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, outsider telling us this story, a guy walks into a bar and tells you a tale. Ricky became the voice of the film in terms of anchoring down the, the delivery of that information. Now that sort of like design meeting, you know, language really culminated in, in the look of the film, this idea of it being a cat's tail. Now, because it was a cat's tail, that kind of took our point of view, affected our camera, affected our textures, affected the, the fact that every frame in the movie should feel like it's sort of handmade because it's not real. So all of these choices were happening at the same time while we were trying to adapt the story. Now, in Lois's book, it's an ensemble cast, but there was a character that sort of felt like he was stepping forward, an unlikely hero, a sure panted boy named Tim. Now, one of the things that I was really attracted to was the notion that Tim was kind of an anti-hero in the vein of, you know, uh, the kind of like 
bossy, nerdy, uh, overprotective type that you've seen in ensemble pieces, you know, from sitcoms to movies. We wanted to kind of take that type, that very Mo type of personality and drive it into his character. So working with Pete early on, Pete Oswald, we were designing the character to sort of have that feeling. Now in the book, uh, Tim, the age of Tim was sort of hard to define, but he was, he was kind of in that bossy kind of preteen sort of age. One of the ideas that really felt funny to us when Pete did these drawings was this notion that Tim has just had a growth spurt and shot up out of the only pair of trousers he's ever had his whole life. So that's sort of where the short pants came from, almost like a tree growing around a, a fence post. You know, it's sort of like he's, he's being swallowed in those, in those short pants. And as our, our, we ended up hiring our lead designer, Craig Kelman, to kind of distill all this information. As that information distilled down, this idea of like Tim as being sort of the, uh, you know, bossy kid with a heart of gold began to show itself in the form of a Q-tip. And as that world sort of the build out from Tim, we had to, of course, like, you know, as you do in stories, figure out what his want was and what his need was. Now, the notion of family being the anchor of this movie uh, was an interesting prospect. So what if, and this wasn't in her book, but what if what Tim was striving for was this family legacy? And this family legacy being something visual that we could illustrate and hang on the walls around the museum of their house, that became very interesting. And that led us to the idea of the red yarn hair too, connecting all of these um, ancestors through time. So what we were trying to do, again, going back to Grey Gardens, was set up the fact that this was an old fashioned family and we needed to illustrate that. So in Lois's book, she kind of talked about it, but there was no illustration of it. So we used this idea of like the family portraits as this legacy tied together with this red hair and this sort of line of mustachioed men, like that kind of uh, weight on Tim felt like a good motivator for his character. Of course, Tim wasn't alone in this world. And in the book, there was a great relationship between him and Jane. Now, Jane was the youngest of the Willoughby's in, in, in Lois's novel. And the idea was that she was sort of the opposite of Tim. So if Tim was loud and bossy and had a heart of gold, Jane was mousy and quiet and insecure about her own self, but she was very subversive. And there was a sort of quiet smartness. Like in reading the book, you got the sense that she was maybe the smartest person in the whole family, but nobody listened to her. So as we were developing Jane, this is a Luis Granier did these early designs. We were playing with that idea of her being a quiet, shy, mousy, very smart kid. Um, and, and as we started to kind of stretch her into, you know, fitting in with Tim, we went through the screening process and we very quickly realized that while that worked in the novel, we actually kind of lost Jane very quickly in the book. And Tim came off as dominant in a way that wasn't funny. So we had to find a way to kind of bring Jane up and pull Tim back. And all of this is happening, basically riffing on the book, but also like learning from our audience interaction. So one of the things that Kyle did with this drawing of Jane, the one on the left, is there's a subversiveness in her where she sort of felt dangerous to me. And that, that felt funny. And the idea of like, let Lois have her, like the smart kid uh, had a voice that nobody really listened to. We wanted to take that and own it. So in Scratch, we started to play around with the idea of Jane being a musical character and her having this song that nobody wanted to hear, but she was constantly singing it the whole movie and that annoying brother-sister way, but at the very end, it kind of breaks out and becomes, you know, the, the theme of the film. So as that was developing, so we, we were, as, as I said, in the book, Jane was the youngest. Now we've moved Jane up to be more Tim's age. That left us with the twins. Now in the story, the twins were kind of like mini Tims and this idea of like kind of, you know, poop rolls downhill. So Tim was bossy, the twins were a little bossy over Jane and Jane got the, got the, the grunt of it. Well, we were rearranging the Tim and Jane dynamic. So that meant we had to rearrange the twin dynamic. Now in some of these early designs, you can see we were playing around with Lois Lowry's kind of shape language in terms of how she drew in the book with the dot eyes and the kind of stretched out characters. But very quickly we realized that the twins couldn't compete. And as you often find in animated films, if your ensemble gets too big, it can get unwieldy and hard to sort of manage. So one of the things that we started to play with is the idea of like, maybe let's shrink the twins. What if they were the youngest? What if they were the afterthought? Like the insult injury of these parents that didn't really want to have kids is that the last batch they had, you know, came out as a couple, not one. So you have an extra mouth to feed. So Kyle in this very bottom left-hand design, he was playing around with that notion. He came up with the idea like maybe what if they had like hair like Danny from The Shining? You know, there was that kind of very iconic shape language and that mushroom shape. And what this ended up giving us was a way to park the twins. 
So the twins could sit back in shots and they could almost be like goalposts in terms of the way they sit compositionally in the world. So as we were working on design and figuring out their voice, you know, I, I constantly go back to the book and see what Lois was using them for. So quite often what they were used for was to validate Tim. So we actually kept that idea in the story. And so the twins are kind of like the swing vote for twin, for Tim and Jane. I grew up, I had two brothers. So there was three of us on a farm and I always loved the idea of like the swing vote. So usually it was me and my middle brother would be fighting. And my youngest brother was the chip that you'd play depending on, you know, what kind of uh, leverage you had and whether you wanted to get family dynamic power. So we wanted to use the twins in that way. And that came directly from the book. Of course, as we got this little foursome worked out, um, you know, there's the family one is born into and then there's the family you choose and that became a big theme and it was there in the book and this idea of like you know Lois Lowry had the notion that you know these kids wanted to be orphans and then when they discovered what it was like in the real world to be an orphan that it's not like in the books that it's not all romantic it's not all charming and fun it's not all about plucky joy that there's actually this you know underpinning a family that they're kind of challenging uh, by the end of the story, they reverse themselves and decide to undo their mistake. So we, but we needed the outside world to collide with them to give us that, that idea. So if you look at Craig Kelman's lineup here, one of the things that design wise came forward as we were breaking the story was this notion that the Willoughby's were all a little bit mummified that they're a little bit starved and skeletal, this idea that they're living in a museum and that everything that comes into their world brings something new. So shape language, color, uh, voice, music. So the collisions with the outside world, that became a really interesting idea from the book that we wanted to build off of. So as you can see here with these early Ruth designs, this notion that she comes in um, as not a Willoughby. So this idea of branding the Willoughbys with that red kind of yarn gave us an opportunity to sort of say what's not a Willoughby very quickly. And, you know, that fish out of water theme that was in the book, we wanted to expand and elaborate on. Now, because this is a visual medium and we're going into a world that is now, I really wanted to play not only with the tropes of children's literature, but specifically the tropes of animated, the animated feature world. So this notion of, you know, um, Ariel getting legs and going on to land, I wanted the, the, the Willoughby's to feel that way when they walked into the city. And everybody they collide with brings with Lois Lowry had sort of set up this idea of the tropes that carry through to the secondary characters and then she would flip those tropes and subvert them and try to find ways to make them funny and, and modern. So the notion of like the collision with Ruth, you know, going back, oops, sorry, the collision with Ruth being an unwanted baby was that this baby wasn't in danger. We wanted to really play with the idea that this was more like a face-hugging alien than a human baby at the beginning of the story. Same thing with Commander Melanoff. He, the idea that he was like a, um, a Daddy Warbucks, Willy Wonka, you know, uh, Citizen Kane type was there in the story. We wanted to really build this out. The notion that the kids are gonna run into this man who's you know, got all the resources in the world to give them what they need, but doesn't want to be in a family because he's got this tragic backstory. That was really interesting. Um, early designs by Pete Oswald, you can kind of see the notion of him being like a little bit of a broken addict living on his own candy. Um, but as we started to expand that out, we started to realize that Melanoff needed to very quickly make the statement of being something other than a Willoughby. And this notion of him being a commander and coming from like the mysterious East with a name like Melanoff, that really started to step forward and, and get exciting to us. One of the things that was really important to me too was casting. And I wanted the idea that as we went out of the Willoughby house, everybody they collide with in this world should feel like it's from a city that we recognize now. So uh, I was living in Ontario at the time, so should have that feeling of Toronto or Boston or Chicago where you know it's it's a diverse world with like different cultures and different skin colors and different voices and different music so uh, I'd worked with um, Terry Crews on, uh, on one of the cloudy films uh, earlier and I just I loved him as a human being and there was something about the commander Melanoff character kind of representing this intimidating exterior with a very soft interior that felt right because Terry is kind of that way He's this kind of jacked up football jock type of guy, but deep down inside, he's, he's, you know, a goofy, artistic, weird, funny, charming, absolutely disarming human being. And so this notion of like Commander Melanoff being this guy who sort of represents candy and joy, but almost being like a brick wall in terms of like the costuming, that felt really funny to us. And we, as we built out the character and sort of find his voice, one of the things that became really obvious is that when we got to this part of the book, 
the whole story takes this tangent and follows his world. So as we invested in trying to discover what his world looked like, this idea, this theme of inside of every character, there's the potential for change is metaphored through this notion of the rainbow. We really wanted to lean on that with the commander. Unfortunately, for the timing of our film, we had to lose something because the movie was, was growing in a way that it was, it was becoming too long for our production needs. So we looked at the commander backstory and we just decided that like there was a, a more efficient way for us to tell it as opposed to sort of spending time in the movie, we wanted to fold it into the film. So we had actually animated this whole stop motion set piece where we explored why the commander was this tragic lost person and the family that he'd lost. So when the Willoughby's find him, he is an orphan too, he's alone. Uh, we had the, we were gonna cut this whole scene. It was gonna drop out of the movie. It ended up getting nested into the screens. So I'm gonna play you the stop motion scene and um, you, know, you can see what was sort of there in terms of motivating his backstory. I'm Commander Melanoff, and this is my story. Candy was my life's passion. I turned sugar into joy. And that joy led me to her. My sweetie. We fell into syrupy love. Oh. But she had chosen another. Gelato. The jealousy I felt for this outside sweet drove me insane! To win back her love, I had to be the best! But nothing I made was as rich as gelato! Hey guy, I brought you some gelato! No! Not ready! Uh, go away, sweetie! Stop calling me sweetie! My name is Ruth! Ruth? I didn't know her name was Ruth. <laughs> Lickety twist! Sweetie! Uh, Ruth! Uh, sweetie Ruth! You are gonna love me now! She left me. And now, all I do is work. <laughs> Randy Dandy. <laughs> Understanding where Commander Melanoff came from came out of the book, but we had to find a more efficient way through it. The same thing for the nanny. In the story, she came in as a reference point to like the Mary Poppins nanny, the tropes of children's literature you've seen before. We wanted to take that and subvert it. Like early designs, you can see we're kind of playing with Nanny McPhee, Mary Poppins, but Pete started to kind of come up with these ideas of like, well, what is a nanny now? It's kind of like a babysitter. It's sort of like, you know, somebody who's maybe in college, uh, you know, maybe uh, somebody working through um, student debt or, you know, what, what kind of a person would be doing that job now in a modern city? So as we were playing with these designs, uh, Craig, who our lead designer, got really fascinated with this musician Lizzo that had at, at the time started to really break out. She did an appearance on Siren Alive, which just blew everybody's mind. And we got really excited about the idea of her being this big, you know, kind of joyful expression of love, which is really what I, you know, kind of got out of Lizzo's music. So Craig started to experiment with, with that kind of design language going into Nanny. Now, we always thought that Nanny was going to be comedy relief in the story, too, because the idea is she collides with the kids. So there's some of these nannies that get a little bit strange and weird. But as you can see, we're developing these sort of ideas of like of her shape language and her kinetic energy. As we start to distill this down, one of the notions was that in the book, Lois Lowry had this idea that like the nanny kind of brings kindness into the world of the Willoughby's and she starts to really teach the kids the value of family in that way that Mary Poppins does in, 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 in the trope. What if we distilled that way down in, into the notion that nanny actually represents love and that kind of led us to the, the love shaped hair. At that time we were also casting and casting is very important. It's very important to me that the character's voice feels right. So we, when we brought in my Rudolph, all of that 
learning, all of that thinking about what Nanny represented in Lois's book started to anchor down into the voice of Maya Rudolph. And as you can see in this clip, I'm going to play you uh, just an early storyboarded sequence. We started off treating Nanny as this very broad, you know, kind of pushed eccentric character that explodes the Willoughby world. And I'll play the sequence to talk about what we learned. Oh, interesting. Wow. What evil sound <gasps> darkens our Willoughby heart? Yeah. Huh? You must be the children. I'm your nanny. Nanny? I've got no qualifications but a cheery disposition. If you please, dear child. Huh? No! <laughs> As head Willoughby, I command thee to leave, woman! Oh, poor short panted top. I know you must miss your parents terribly, but nanny's here to fill their britches. What we learned was that. Nanny as a big voice was actually adding cacophony to the world. And actually what she really needed to do is bring love. And as we distilled that down, as our design language and, and all of our choices kind of came, again, from the book into the film, we started to turn her into this really empathetic, fun character with all of this sort of big energy. But ultimately, you know, she changes the Willoughby world. She brings the, the air from the outside in and starts to change them. Those are our heroes. Lois also gave us a pair of really great baddies, the parents. Now, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that the parents being neglectful and being a little bit mean, we, we had to ride that line because there's a really, you know, uh, truthful version of that that isn't fun. And so we had to find our way into these parents to, to, to give the audience permission to laugh. And as we worked through Craig's designs, one of the things that really became funny was this notion that maybe these are adults that haven't grown up themselves. They've never had their coming of age story. They've never gone through the, the, the emotions of what it means to be an adult. And so they're kind of looking after kids in the museum, but they don't know how to be parents. And so there's an innocence to them. And so as we started to break that down, as you can see, the comedy of the design was, was all pushing towards us making sure that they remain funny. And then as we kind of took this through our animation, you can, you can see these are the broadest characters in our story with the biggest shape language, with the biggest change of like kind of, um, you know, tone and, 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 uh, and posing. And all of that was just to keep them funny. So ultimately, you know, we, we've set up our, our, our conflict out of the book of our ensemble cast of heroes and our, and, and our um, villains. And the next thing we had to do was build out the world. So in terms of our set design, one of the things that really anchored me when I read Lois's book is it reminded me of my own childhood. I grew up in, in a, as I said, like uh, the East. And in this old city, there was all these Victorian houses that were kind of littered around, uh, you know, not far from where I grew up. And I always wanted to sort of be in those places. They felt like fairy tale houses. These are photos from, from London, Ontario. And so as we started to de design and build out the world, the idea was like, what if this was a place in Chicago and the world had kind of grown up around it? So the comedy wasn't that they ran away from the world, it was that they kind of forgot to come out and the world forgot them. And so that notion of a forgotten story was really like anchored in, in the book. So as this design language kind of built out, as we started to find, you know, the, the world, the reference points were very literal. So I was reading the book and I was going to this museum that's just down the road from where the studio was called the Elden House. And it was about this old colonial family. And what I, my takeaway was it was kind of funny because they had all this dead stuff on the wall, but nobody lived in this house. And we took that forward into our, into our design language. Again, this is all coming out of Lois Lowry's book. Book, but referencing what I was seeing in real life, even down to in the museum, there was an elephant's foot you know, umbrella stand, which is, you know, kind of appalling, but weird and, and strange and a funny thing to have in a house. And so we put that right into the movie. So as we were building out the world, as you can see, design and story and adaptation, all of this was coming together to create these sets that, again, give our audience permission to laugh so that it never really felt like a documentary. This house had to come down. Um, this clip is, is, is basically about like, you know, the end of this legacy. And that will bring us to the big world. Again, like with the characters, we wanted this, the collision of what we knew from the book in terms of the, the family in this house and the world outside. We wanted that contrast to come forward and really pop. Uh, one of the notions that Kyle had, our production designer, was that the whole world should have a lean to it, that handmade feeling. And I really love the idea that even as we kind of built through 
all of the textures and stuff, it should feel like people actually built these places with bricks and with glass and with real materials. And so all those materials came through. This was all to ground us in that story of coming of age. Um, as the parents went out on their road trip too, what we ended up kind of creating was this expanded world. So as the movie goes forward, the world gets bigger. And all of that came out of the book, this notion of a sitcom that explodes into a feature. And so as the kids get their road trip, as they harness the rainbow and travel, we actually wanted to distill the language so it actually takes us closer to it being a children's book. And you can see these little literal illustrations that were inspired by the novel actually made it directly into the film. As the kids get close to the end of their journey and they start to choose the wrong parents, their biological parents in the case of the story, we wanted to pull color out and distill it down to like this very idea of it being a cold choice. Now in the book, the way the story ends is that the kids find the parents frozen on the side of the mountain and they walk away. We couldn't end the story that way. So that kind of led us to this notion of what if we had three endings? The, the idea of like, you know, the kids discovering the lesson of the film and, and making the choice for the wrong parents. So in that 80s style kind of, you know, there's the girl next door and then there's the, the girl you're chasing. If you're looking at Teen Wolf or, you know, Better Off Dead or Can't Buy Me Love, it's always the girl next door, which is the, you know, the one that's overlooked is the one that the characters should fall in love with. And in our case, it was the parents next door. So there was the commander and nanny, but they were ultimately needing to undo their mistake because we didn't want to walk away telling the audience that it's okay to murder your parents. So we wanted to make sure that that, we let the kids off the hook. So we have our cold ending, which is kind of like your your traditional ending where the kids come back to the parents and they make their pitch for a better version of the family. The parents screw them, steal the Zeppelin. Then we have our tragic Canadian independent film ending, which was, you know, the kids freezing on the side of a mountain. And then ultimately we have our sitcom, happy Roseanne Barr ending where uh, the, the right parents show up and save the day. And all of this is driven through the story by color. And as you can see, like one of the things that Kyle was building was that if the kids are going towards the right decision, they're rewarded with color. You know, as they're going out into the city, they're rewarded with color from the rainbow. In the house, they're, they're being sort of like blanketed in the autumnal colors of the end. And I love autumn, it's my favorite season, but it represents the end of something. And as they get closer to the wrong decision, you see that the world goes cold. So ultimately, color being a mood ring for the film was, was happening at the same time as we were adapting the story. So I guess at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that um, I learned on this journey, and I've gone through this, you know, journey of adapting a movie a few times before from a book, is that you have to almost have two hats on. You have to listen to the book and listen to the story, but also like pay attention to the audience because you're really translating it from one medium to another. And as you work through the words in a script, I don't think you can create a world without the visuals. And those two things sort of for my process really come together. And that represents the map of where you find the movie is actually, it's not about the academics of what you keep and what you throw away. It's what works in that visual world as you go through the exploration of, you know, finding your film. Yeah, so at the end of the day, I think, you know, um, we went through the journey of, you know, being very close to the book, to finding a movie that was of its own story, that was of its own weight. But when I stand back from it, I still hear Lois Lowry in there. From the language of the kids to the idea of, you know, um, taking the tropes of, children's literature and film and flipping them on their head not in a cynical way but in a way that sort of celebrates and enjoys I think the stereotype of what a kids movie is but also lets the audience laugh at it um, and hopefully at the end of the day like Lois Lowry's book which surprised me and, and sort of made me remember what it was like to be a kid reading those dark stories I hope this movie does the same thing to audiences uh you know in terms of it not being maybe what they expect when they come in but with the message that's worth hearing uh that's it so thank you very much and I hope you guys have a great CTN cheers bye